2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. I'll read the text and then would you please join me in a word of prayer after I, re- after I read it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Lord, as we spend now time in Your, in your Holy Word, I pray that You would give us understanding by Your Spirit. Thank You, Lord, for each man, woman, and child here with us, those that are visiting with us today. Lord, I pray that they would be blessed uh, by your word, Lord, use me as your vessel, as your servant. Lord, may the words of my mouth and Lord, the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and joyful in your sight. We ask these things in the name of our Savior. Amen. The insert there in your bulletin goes with the morning servant sermon because this is called the glory of the mission of God. And so you can pull that out. I will be referring to that at some point in the sermon. But consider this message as a bridge in between uh, this season of the resurrection that we are uh, joyfully in right now, and also that series I've been preaching through the book of Judges. This sermon is is really a bridge between these two things. And here's why. What God did in the days of Joshua and following, which means conquering the land of Canaan and then God's people enjoying the blessing of God, the gift of God for His people, This was only a foretaste, it was only a foreshadowing of the ultimate mission that God in Christ would redeem the whole world, conquer all evil through Jesus Christ, and then upon His people just pour out the blessing of His people so that through the church, the whole world and all families would be blessed. Keep in mind that Jesus' name in Hebrew is Joshua. There's a reason for that. As God used and raised up Joshua in the entrance into the land of Canaan, that Joshua is going to deliver God's people into this promised land, when God came in the flesh through His Son, He received in Hebrew the name Joshua, Yeshua. In Greek, it's pronounced Jesus, but His name is Joshua. And so there's a reason for this. It's because He's the greater Joshua who's not merely leading His people into the land of Canaan, but he is actually leading the charge and the victory of God's people to redeem and rescue and take the whole world, all nations, for the glory of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so look at that first uh, quote here, there in your your, uh, handout there in the bulletin. This comes from Roderick Campbell. He wrote this great book called Israel and the New Covenant, and he was referring to Galatians chapter 3, where the Apostle Paul is writing about how Christ is the promised seed of Abraham and that through the seed of Abraham, all nations would be blessed and that this is God's plan, God's mission as we look into the future. However long it might be, we don't know. How it might be accomplished, we don't even know. But God said through Christ, all the nations of the earth would be blessed because He's the true son of Abraham. And Roderick Campbell writes this, over against the old covenant inheritance, which was the land flowing with milk and honey, which Israel had to conquer with the material sword, stands the new covenant inheritance, a world conquered for Christ. The promised land for the church is the fulfillment of the worldwide promise to Abraham, which fulfillment will coincide with the completion of the church's missionary task. The promised land then is not merely a type of heaven, but a renewed humanity. The true promised land is the new earth, an earth separated from the heathendom and the paganism and finally dedicated to the service of God. What Roger Campbell is pointing out there is that the old covenant promised land of Canaan, which flowed with milk and honey, which was conquered by the material sword led by Joshua, that was a foreshadow, that was a foretaste of what God would do through Christ, the new Joshua, the better Joshua, the greater Joshua, who's going to use His holy called out people, the church. Though we are weak, though we are small, though we're oftentimes persecuted 
and forgotten. Though we are weak, He is strong. And He's going to use us for this mission, which is to bring about the promises of Abraham to all nations, meaning a worldwide blessing. God said to Father Abraham, through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And He promised to Abraham, Romans chapter 4 says, the whole world, that your descendants will be as the stars in the sky, and that through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is, was Israel's mission, and they consistently failed at it. And so Israel in the flesh came into the world. The true son of Abraham and the true Israelite who never sinned, who is the light of the world, he comes, pays for the sins of the world, rises again, and says, seated at the right hand of God the Father, that he is making all things new. And believe it or not, he's going to do it through the church. He's going to do it through us. Us who are weak, oftentimes storm-tossed by the world and by different trials, yet he's going to build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so what we read in, for instance, Joshua and Judges, what we read in 1 Samuel as the, as the people of God come into Canaan to enjoy its riches and to fight by faith as God called them to, this was a foreshadow of what the glory and the power of the mission of God in the new covenant. God is going to redeem the whole world through Christ and following in His footsteps the people who belong to Christ. And so look again at our text here in 2 Corinthians. Look at the worldwide implications of the, of the blood and the glory and the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what He accomplishes. Verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So Christ accomplished a new creation. So the Gospel of John begins with, In the beginning. Just as Genesis begins with, In the beginning, because through Christ there's a new creation, there's a new beginning. And the message is, if you are in Him, you belong to Christ, you are the evidence and the outworking of that new creation because He has given you a new mind and a new heart to now not be who you once were, but day by day and year by year to be transformed to be more like Jesus Christ. He is the author and the finisher of the new creation. Verse 18, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So now the Apostle Paul is talking about the church. Verse 18 says, Here is what Christ has done. He has reconciled you to God through Christ. Sin had separated us from God, and the mission of Christ is to bring God back to people. To bring people back to God. He's the prophet and the priest and the king of the new covenant. And so he delivers the word of God to the people, but as the great high priest, he brings the people to the Father, and by the shed blood and the broken body of Christ, you and I have union with the Father again. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and all who come to Him by faith will have peace with God, and having peace with God, you will now enjoy the peace of God. But look, it doesn't stay in the church. If God blesses a church, it doesn't stay in a church. If God blesses a family, it doesn't stay in the family. But Psalm 1 says the, the, the man or the woman who hears the Word of God and delights in it and does it, they will become like a tree planted by the water. And what does a tree do? A tree gives shade and fruit. A tree becomes something for the birds of the air to land in. And so if God blesses a church, if God blesses a family, that pours out. The cup overflows. So then look at 19. If God has reconciled us to Him and He has begun the new creation in you, that pours out to where? The whole world. Verse 19. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting the trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. And so we find in verses 17, 18, and 19, the picture gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Verse 17 says, if you're in Christ as an individual, you're a new creation. And then it says, and the church has been reconciled to the Father through Christ. And then verse 19 says, and this blessing goes out to the whole world. Every nation is God's desire. Just as God sent the Israelites under Joshua to receive the land and enjoy its benefits, so too He has sent His only Son into the world to reconcile the whole world to Himself. And we are called 
to follow in His footsteps. And so we wage spiritual warfare. So we are given the armor of God. And here's the beautiful thing. Christ has so transformed the world by His life, death, and resurrection that even our warfare as Christians, even as we are entrenched in in a fight against darkness and evil, even our warfare blesses and not devastates the world around us. Even our warfare as Christians, as we fight against our own temptation, as we fight against spiritual wickedness and, and dark places, even this warfare blesses the world rather than devastates it. And so, what is the the mission of God? To to summarize it into one phrase, I believe it's the renewal of His people, and as His people are are renewed, this brings salvation to the farthest parts of the world, one soul at a time. The mission of God is the renewal of His people, which brings the salvation of the world to the ends of the earth, one soul at a time. And as God brought Joshua and the Israelites into Canaan, so too the promised land of the new covenant is heaven, but it's also a renewed earth, it's salvation, and it's Jesus himself. What does Jesus tell his disciples on the road to Emmaus? Remember Luke chapter 24. This is soon after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. He's talking to two of his disciples, and they are very confused. They don't know what took place. They think that Jesus is still in the tomb dead, and they were so distraught because they thought that he was the Messiah, but now he's dead in a tomb. And Jesus comes up and starts to talk to them and says, hey, what's going on? Look what he says, Luke 24. He said to them, thus it was written that the Christ should first suffer and then on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And he says to them, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. The Lord Jesus gives this mission to his disciples. The Son of God came, he laid down his life, and three days later he rose again. And now he says, you are my witnesses to bring this message, starting in Jerusalem, to all nations. And then he ends by saying, basically, if you're going to do anything at all for the mission of God, you must be clothed with divine power. If you are going to do anything for the kingdom of God, you must be empowered by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And so he tells them, wait in the city until the day of Pentecost. Then the Holy Spirit of God will be poured out upon you. This is the big picture, the grand mission of God, is that he's going to bless all nations and reconcile the world to himself not by human ingenuity, not by human cleverness. If it, was, if it was in our hands alone, we would fail, and the mission would fail. But this mission is led by Christ and empowered by the Spirit that He gives freely to everyone who asks. One Christian from past days writes this, and he's uh, in, this, in the midst of, a, of this, uh, this quote that I'm going to read you, he quotes a whole bunch of scriptures, but what he's saying is this is the unfolding of the mission of God as it relates to God's plan for the world going into the future. The church is to grow and spread far and wide her holy influences so as to leave the unthinking worldliness of this age without excuse. Jesus has said, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Isaiah prophesied from afar, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and all nations shall flow unto it. The name of Christ shall be known from the rising of the sun even until the going down of the same. More is promised in, this, in the Bible many times. This promise, the knowledge of God shall cover the earth. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord even as the waters cover the sea. The time shall come when it shall be said the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ and that Christ shall reign forever and ever. World without end, Revelation teaches us. We cannot explain all these scriptures without truly anticipating a day of better things for the church than has yet been realized. Knowledge of Christ will banish superstition. Idolatry will cease. Human sacrifice will end. Apostate churches, meaning churches that have fallen away and left the faith, they will either be revived or be destroyed. False religions will be overthrown. Enlightened governments permeated with Christian truth will displace tyrannies and liberty will become the heritage of all nations. 
When God rules, the people are glad. This is what God has planned, and it is indescribably glorious. And here's what I would say. Not only will this happen, but God has been doing this ever since the resurrection of the Son of God. The world has been different ever since the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he rose from the grave, the new creation was inaugurated. The, the kingdom of God was established. And so when we dip into the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is not merely a series of visions of what might happen in the future. Ultimately, the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, who, in the power of His Gospel, rides forth to conquer all the forces of evil. Conrad Miller submits this, were it solely based on human exertion, I would wholeheartedly agree that the redemption of the world is impossible. But it's not based on human exertion. It's not based on how strong or how weak the church is. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit and His work continues and He remains with us to ensure the success and the victory of the Gospel in this world. Christ will prevail and He has invited His church to be part of that victory. And so the Apostle Paul says, we always follow in triumphal procession through Jesus Christ. And this is the Apostle Paul who was persecuted, was stoned, was shipwrecked, was abandoned, was hated, and ultimately was martyred. He knew what it meant to suffer. And so the Apostle Paul does not say to the church that everything is going to be uh, jolly and everything's going to go smoothly. No, you will face various trials. In this world, you will have trouble. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you will suffer for His namesake. Jesus talks about this again and again in the Gospels. But the tone and the message and the character of the kingdom of God is that He prevails. That through the trials through the sufferings, through even the persecution of the church, this is how God leads us in triumphal procession. We win not just how the world does through force and violence and corruption, but we win as Christ wins, as becoming the servant of all, laying down our lives, and enjoying His blessings that He speaks upon our heads. Look at that second quote. This comes from Christopher Wright, and actually in the book called The Mission of God. He writes this, The nations of humanity preoccupy the biblical narrative from beginning to end. When they are not in the foreground, they are there in the background. When they are not the subject of great international events, they are the object of divine inspection or accusation. When they are not the direct focus of God's attention, they remain in the surrounding context for good or ill. He's talking about the nations. The obvious reason for this is that the Bible is, of course, preoccupied with the relationship between God and humanity, and humanity exists in nations. And where the Bible focuses especially on the people of God, that people necessarily in history is in the midst of the nations or the Gentiles. It is clear that Israel, as a light to the nations, is no peripheral theme. The nations are the matrix of Israel's life, the reason for her very existence. To summarize that, God is using His people that He has called out of darkness into light for this particular purpose, to be a lighthouse to all the nations, to send out His Word to all the nations. And so the risen Christ, before He ascends up to heaven, He says, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and preach the gospel to every creature. Bring this news to every nation baptizing the nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And behold, I'll be with you forever, even until the end of the world. And so here are some short applications to the mission of God. This is what it means to believe in the God of not only the past and not only the present, but the God of the future, is that Christian eschatology, which is a big word for our understanding of end times, should come... I believe from 1 Corinthians 15 where the Apostle Paul talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ says here is what God has planned for the future. God will raise all people. Death will be the final opponent and enemy that Christ deals a fatal blow to. All people will be raised and then comes the final judgment of all men. The sheep will go with the Lord Jesus and the goats will go into everlasting torment. 
the resurrection, the final judgment, and then we find in 1 Corinthians 15 that the kingdom of God, which Christ, by the power of His Spirit, has made beautiful and complete, is given to the Father as a gift. The Son gives the kingdom completed to the Father by the very nail-scarred hands of Christ in return of the Father's gift of the nations to His Son. And so last week I talked about Psalm 2. The Father gave the Son the nations as a reward of His suffering and resurrection. And at the end of the world, God the Son, it says, gives the kingdom to the Father as a gift. And this is done after the final opponent, death, is finally done away through the resurrection of all of God's people. And until then, Scripture says that our Lord, the risen Lord, sits enthroned at the right hand of God, rolling and reigning until He comes again. And so Christian, don't fret. Don't worry. Don't run around with your head cut off. Rather rejoice. This is the victory of Jesus Christ. He sits enthroned and He is Lord of all. And then just as I had mentioned last week, Acts chapter 2 says, believe this good news, be saved, and continue in it. Not only believe this once, but continue in it. Daily, weekly, remind yourself, encourage yourself, remembering always Jesus Christ, the Son of David, who was risen from the dead. Receive this, and then go out and give this blessing to others. You are blessed so that you might go out and bless others. This is what Psalm 67 says. The very first verse says, Lord, bless us and keep us. Shine your face upon us so that we can go out and bless the nations. Focus and press on as you interact with people. See all people as either Christians or almost Christians. See them as Christians or, or, or the basic one I'm saying, the opportunity to bring them to the knowledge of Jesus Christ because by His Spirit, He's able to make anyone who is spiritually dead, spiritually alive. The world is your mission field. As much as we long to see our friends come to know the Lord, also let us long to see the nations come to know the Lord. Focus on this. Realize that this is the reason you have been redeemed, to go out and proclaim the Redeemer. Because this passage here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. The passage ends in this way. Verses 20 and 21. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making His appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, He made Him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Let us pray. Lord, as we come now at the end of this sermon, may not stay here, but may it encourage and enliven, realizing that we have a strong Savior who is not merely hoping for the best, who but, but who sits enthroned, rolling and reigning until all nations are blessed through the Gospel and transformed by the good news. Lord, we come to You asking for mercy and help. Lord, there are many things in Your Word that, that are indeed hard to understand, and, and we will even as Christians, suffer for the name of Christ and will experience hardships as a church, as families, as individuals. But we look to You and Your Son who overcame the world and emptied the grave. For in there we find endless hope and an unshakable foundation to rest on. We give You thanks through Jesus our Lord. Amen. You may remain seated. Let us... Pray this prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.